Chelsea. I was, yeah, I was supposed to give it to you. I forgot. Wait. Communion? Well, good morning. Welcome to Hope Fellowship. Happy Palm Sunday. Let's stand together as we begin our worship service. We're so glad to see you. We're going to just celebrate our Savior today and his work on the cross. And we're, at the end of the service, we're going to be taking communion today. So prepare your hearts as we do that today. Well, let's put our hands together. All 
today for all that he has done for us, for his amazing grace, for the cross, that he paid the debt for us. Amen. Amen. We're thankful to him.
Till all my fears are gone. Go sing it out. I'm no longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. worship you this morning, God. You're so worthy. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again into your family. Your blood situation, Lord God, that we're faced with. Lord, we thank you for being our rock, our friend. And we thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us each and every day, Lord. Lord, give us ears to hear your word today. We thank you in Jesus' name. And we all say amen. You may be seated. Amen. You may be seated at this time. We're going to continue to worship the Lord with our giving. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward to receive those at this time. Whether they're coming forward, we just want to once again welcome you watching online today. We're so happy to have, have you with us today. Happy Palm Sunday. And if you're here for the first time in our building today, we also want to welcome you. A special welcome to you inside of your bulletins and communication card. And we'd love for you to fill that out. Put it in our drop box at the back of our sanctuary. And we'd love to send a gift in the mail today, this week to you to say thank you for joining with us here at Hope Fellowship. Let's pray over our offering. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the ability, Lord, to give to you and to your purposes and your mission. And we just pray that you would use our gifts, that you would use this um, offerings and this ties, Lord, to just further your mission here in Chestertown and beyond. And we love you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are so thankful for all those who came out and helped yesterday for our Easter extravaganza. We had a wonderful turnout. We had about 270 people be touched by our church yesterday as they came through. So thank you, volunteers. Let's give the Lord a hand. It was a great day, and Pastor Molly just wanted to say a special thank you to all those who volunteered and helped throughout the whole process from Stuff and Eggs to be in there yesterday. We really appreciate your help. And then we are just gearing up for Easter. This next Sunday is Easter weekend, and so we will have four services. We will have Saturday evening at 6 p.m. and then the regular three on Sunday morning. So you can register for those even today. The registration is open for those services, and we are going to be streaming those online all four of them and so for you who are watching online you can take your pick um, next week of which service you would like to watch and so we're looking forward to a celebrating Easter together as a family amen, amen. and um, celebrating our Lord and we look forward to that and if you would like um, we will have kids and nursery for all of our services as well and we still are looking for some nursery workers to help us as we expand back to three services on Sundays we want to now open our nursery to eight and eleven um, so if you'd like to help us in that area, we would love to have your help as well going forward after Easter. So let Pastor Molly know or sign up online. Let's go to the word today. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. We're so thankful that you're here. Happy Palm Sunday. We want to welcome those that are joining us online this morning. And uh, is it just me or does it rain more Sundays than it doesn't rain? It just seems like it dumps, uh, although I think we had a good one last week. But uh, anyway, it's still the day the Lord has made. Amen? Amen? So we'll rejoice and be glad with that. Well, let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to take communion at the end of service, so I'm going to leave time for that. So let's go right to it as we're going to continue this morning with our series on the life of Abraham. And we are almost finished with this study. Maybe two weeks left, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, I don't know. I've been 10, you understand how it goes with me, but we'll see where we go um, after today. You know, there are a lot of um, well-known stories from Abraham's life um, that people know about. I mean, most people know the story of Abraham leaving his home country to go follow God, even though he didn't know where he was going. A lot of people know the story about the birth of Ishmael, the story about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of people know the story about the miraculous birth of Isaac. And really, if you think about it, all those stories, they kind of transcend religion. I mean, a lot of these stories are known in popular culture as well. And I think there's just so, so amazing, wonderful themes that run through all these stories. You got adventure, and you got birth, and you got death, you got miracles, you got judgment, you got personal choice, you got sexual immorality, you got all kinds of stories here throughout Abraham's life. But our story today is the most famous of the stories that come, comes from Abraham's life. Today, we're going to see God put Abraham's faith to the test. Now, here's what you need to know. It's not the first time that God's going to test his faith. If you remember, he tested his faith with a famine when he first arrived in the promised land back in Genesis chapter 12. God literally tested his faith for 25 years as he waited for Isaac to be born. He tested his faith in the encounter with a Philistine king, Abimelech, that we looked at back in Genesis chapter 21. And if you remember from those previous tests, Abraham didn't really pass any of them. He, he didn't even come close to passing those tests with flying colors. In fact, he pretty much failed each of those tests. Yet what you find is through the failing of those tests, he learned through each one of them. And he grew in his faith as a result of the patience and the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And so what he learned about God is he learned about God's grace and his mercy and about his faithfulness and goodness, about his forgiveness. He learned about God's power to do the impossible. And the proof of Abraham's growing faith is seen in the ultimate test here in Genesis chapter 22. God tests Abraham's faith this time by asking him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And what's, what's so unique to me about this test is, 
unlike the other tests, this time he does it without hesitation. Abraham literally passes this test flying, with flying colors. I mean, it, it's just, he just breathes. It, it, it's almost like how in the world did he pass this one when he struggled with the other test in his life? This is one of the greatest acts of faith that you will read about anywhere in the Bible. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament sums it up this way. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19 says, but by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This story is an amazing story that not only teaches us about times of testing in our lives, but it gives us a, a preview of what Easter is really all about. You see, what Abraham and his son go through in this story is very similar to what God and his son would go through that very first Easter thousands of years later. Get this, in the very same place, at the very same location. And so this is why I thought it would be more meaningful for us after we go through the story to take communion at the end. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a time of worship at the end. As we work our way through this story, I want to share with you what to know when your faith is tested. What you need to know as a child of God when your faith is tested. Here's the first thing to know. Tests are planned. Look at it with me in verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Now let's just stop right there for a second and think about this. Did you notice where the test came from? It came from God, didn't it? It was God's plan to test Abraham's faith. Did you know from time to time, God will purposely test your faith? You will never get to the place in this life where you're exempt from the testing of your faith. I want you to notice verse 1. It says, very first three words, it says, sometime later. I want you to understand that this test happens after the greatest time of rest that Abraham ever had in his entire life. Look at the end of chapter 21 for a second. After Isaac was finally born, you remember how long he waited for that miracle to happen? After the whole thing with Ishmael and Hagar had resolved itself, Look what we're told here at the end of chapter uh, 21. It says, after the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech, remember him from chapter 21, Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. So, what do you, so they, they, they made a peace treaty together. And then in verse 33, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Don't you understand, verse 34 represents a long stretch of peaceful years in Abraham's life. By the time we get to chapter 22, Isaac is probably anywhere from 12 to 17 years old. So more than a decade has passed since what we studied last week. And it is an unprecedented time of peace in Abraham's life. He has peace in his life for the first time in a long time. He has peace in his home. And he has peace with his enemies. Now in chapter 22, a storm is on the horizon that he never saw coming. Now understand, we know this is a test, but Abraham doesn't know this at this point, nor does he know how this test is going to end. We know because we know how the story turns out. We study the story knowing how this story ends, but remember, Abraham is going through this test in real time, and get this, God never tells them up front that it's a test. We're told it's a test, but God never says, I'm going to test you. Nor did God ask him if he wanted to be tested. Can you imagine if God did that? You know what most of us would say? No. This test just shows up out of the blue. Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your one and only son. Now, now we all know Abraham has more than one son, but Isaac, remember, is the one and only son of the promise. We talked about that last week. So think about this. It seems as if God is unraveling all the promises that he's made to Abraham. You see, God will often test you in the places where your security lies. You understand Isaac represents security 
in his life. The promises that God had made to him, all that he owned, his family's very survival comes down to Isaac, and God is testing him in that area. We all have Isaacs in our lives, don't we? Someone or something that we place our security in. It's often in those areas that God will test your faith. And the test may come in the form of an instruction from him, just like here in Genesis 22. It may come in a surprise twist in your life that you never saw coming. It may even come in the form, are you ready for this, of illness, tragedy, or even a temptation. Now, don't get me wrong. God is not the author of evil. God is not the source of illnesses, tragedies, and temptations. Look what it says in James chapter 1, verse 13. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But he does allow those things to come into our life, doesn't he? He doesn't always stop them. Why? To test us. In fact, let me say this. Sometimes illnesses, tragedies, and temptations are just a product of living in a broken world with broken people. Sometimes it's the devil that's behind those things. But here's what you have to understand. Satan tempts you to bring out the worst in you. God tests you to bring out the best in you. One has purposes to harm you. One has purposes to bring good in your life. So the question that we often wrestle with is, is this temptation from the devil or is it a test from God? Sometimes it's hard to understand the difference, huh? It's hard to tell the difference. So what do you do when you can't tell the difference? Are you ready for this? You trust the sovereignty of God. Because sometimes the temptation that comes to the devil is the test from God. You trust in his sovereignty. That God is a God that works all things for good. For those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You see, sometimes God will allow the devil to tempt us as a way of testing us. You say, Pastor, I don't know about that. You ever read the book of Job? Yeah. <laughs> or have you ever read through the life of Jesus? Yeah. Do you understand God even tested Jesus's faith? Look at it with me for a second. Luke chapter four, verse one through two. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Who's leading him? Spirit. Now watch this where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. The devil did the tempting, but God allowed it to test Jesus. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Remember the evil that his brothers did to him? They sold him into slavery into Egypt. And at the end of the story, God works for good in Joseph's life and he elevates him to second in command to Egypt. And those same brothers now are afraid Joseph's going to get his revenge. But look what Joseph says to them. Watch, verse, uh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but watch this. God meant it for good. And he went through a testing, didn't he? He went through an awful testing. But God meant it for good. Watch this, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Once again, I'm going to say this. Satan tempts you to bring out the worst in you. God tests you to bring out the best in you. He always has good in mind. So I want you to know the tests are planned. Here's the second thing to know that when your faith is tested. Tests will reveal. That's what they do. They reveal the true condition of your faith. Can I just say this? God already knows the condition of your faith. God already knows the true condition of your heart. We don't always know, do we? But what tests do is they reveal that to us. They reveal who we love and what we love. They really reveal to us who we trust and what we trust. They reveal to us what we believe and who we believe. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 1, that word test is the Hebrew word nasa, and it literally means to prove the quality of. So let's go ahead and see what this test reveals to us about the quality of Abraham's faith at this point in his life. And it's really, it's really remarkable. Watch this. Let's go ahead and read the story. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. 
When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for, your burnt, for the burnt offering? Now, I, th- I found a little point in this in the first service. Your children should, should be so familiar how you worship God that there's no question. Now watch verse 8. That, that, that's addendum to the sermon, by the way. <laughs> Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now I want you to notice something back in verse 3. The very beginning of this section. Watch this. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. I don't know about you, but that just jumps off the page to me. That's remarkable. Because there is no hesitation for Abraham in this test. There's absolutely no dragging his feet like earlier in his faith years. He chooses to obey obey God this time immediately. And did you notice that we're not even told how he feels about it? I think that's because we don't have to be told how he feels about this. We all know what this son means to Abraham and Sarah. We know how long they waited. We know how much he loves this son, Isaac. Parents, you can only imagine what's going on in Abraham's heart right now. What is he going to tell Sarah? What is he going to tell people? Is his future going to be secure? How can he even think about doing such a thing to his son? Yet, without hesitation, he makes this three-day journey to the region of Moriah. He takes his son. We're going to see in a moment, he's going to bind him. He's going to lay him on the altar and he's going to lift that knife high in the air with the intention of killing his son. You talk about faith. And you and I sit here and say, what in the world was he thinking? Well, once again, Hebrews chapter 11, look at it once again, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Now, you and I, we all know that God is going to let that knife come down in the story. But he doesn't know that as he's holding that knife high. I mean, think about it. With with that knife at full apex, sun shining, knife sparkling in that sun, at that point, you know what happens? Abraham has passed passed this test with flying colors. By the way, do you know what passing a test looks like always in your life? Obedience to God. Trust in him. That's how you know if you're passing the test. It's obedience to God. It's trust in him. If you're lacking obedience, you're not trusting him. Do you understand that? Even if his plan is different than yours. Even if it means to stay in the place that you don't want to stay in. Even if it means to leave the place you don't want to leave. Let me help you understand how Abraham passed this test, because I think there are a couple things in the story that we can learn from Abraham that can help us get through our biggest test in our life. First thing that Abraham did to get through this test was this. He trusted in the character of God. Look at it. Once again, verse three, notice the words that come out of Abraham's mouth. He set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Now, what's the next word? We We will worship, and then we will come back to you. He anticipates Isaac coming back down that mountain with him. He doesn't understand how God's going to unfold the plan, but he trusts God's plan. Why? Because he trusts in the character of God. Look what he says to Isaac. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, he said, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, for God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. You see, here's the thing. With every test that comes into your life that you face, you will wrestle with one of two thoughts. One, God is fickle and can't be trusted. Or two, God is faithful and can be trusted. That's the dilemma that happens in our minds all the time, isn't it? 
That's what we wrestle with. Can I really trust God? Can I really continue to obey God? Abraham chose the latter of the two here. And here's the cool thing. You know what led him to that conclusion? This is so, so amazing. The previous test of his faith. When he ran from the famine and lied to Pharaoh, he learned that God was faithful to deliver him even in that trial, even when he messed up. When he got ahead of God with Ishmael, he learned about God's goodness, and he understood that God's goodness was still following him in his life, even though he had messed up. When he lied to Abimelech in chapter 21, he learned that the Lord is long-suffering and with the birth of Isaac. You know what he learned? That nothing is impossible for God. With God, even a 90-year-old woman can have a baby. And here was his thinking. If God can resurrect Sarah's dead womb, he can certainly bring Isaac back to life if, if, if I have to follow through with this. You see, one of the best things that you can do in a time of testing when all your emotions are raw and all your... How many know when your emotions are raw, you don't always think straight? We get spiritual amnesia. One of the best things you can do in a, in a time of testing is begin to take a trip down memory lane in your life. And you know what you'll find? You can't help but run into the faithfulness and the goodness and the patience of God all over the place in your life. Yeah. You'll look back and you'll, you'll say, there's a time like Abraham, I got it wrong, but oh my gosh, God was there. Look at the faithfulness of God. Look at the forgiveness of God. Even when I was faithful, he was not. Look at the goodness of God. I went through this at one time, but now I see what God has done. Did you know that some of the tests of your past is how God prepares you to get through some of the tests in your future? Do you realize that? Yeah. Abraham has no hesitation with this test because he knew God is faithful and can be trusted. You know what he learned by this point in his life? And this is a hard place to get to. It's just better to trust God because I just mess everything up when I don't. Some of the previous tests you went through in your life that you failed at were to prepare you for other tests to come. You say, is that really true? Remember the night that Jesus was betrayed and he looked at Peter? He said, everybody, he looked at his disciples and said, everybody's going to run from me. And Peter's like, no, I won't. Remember what Jesus said? Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And you know what Jesus said then? He says, basically says, you're going to fail tonight, but when you turn back and when we get this straight, you're going to strengthen your brothers. Do you realize sometimes God will let you fail on purpose? Parents, that's a good point in there. Sometimes you need to let your kids fail because there's learning in the failing. Yeah. First thing Abraham did to get through this was he just he trusted in the character of God in his life. He understood that God was a good God, that the goodness of God is following him. And he just realized it's just better to trust God than do this my way. Yeah. I'm not going to create another Ishmael in my life. I think that was part of his thought. Here's the second important thing he did that helped him pass this test. He worshiped his way through it. Yes. I want you to notice verse 4 again. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there while we, what's the word? Worship. worship. See, when testing comes into our lives, there's a natural tendency for paralysis to set in. We have a tendency to just want to shut down. Stop doing the things that God has asked us to do. We want to stop going to church. We want to stop fellowshipping with the people of church. We want to stop serving at church. We want to stop ministering to people. Can I say that is always a huge mistake? And that is exactly what the devil wants in your life. Because if he can paralyze you, he can stop your growth, and he can stop you from being used from God, and he can stop your church from being effective in his community. Amen. So instead of shutting down your faith walk, Here's what you need to do when you're facing a trial. Become, just be, start to become preoccupied with God through your time of testing. Yeah, yeah. Turn your time of testing into a time of worship. Yeah. And that's more than just praise and worship songs. How many of you love praise and worship music? Yeah. And we're like, man, I'm being tested. I put that on my car and we're jamming and we're good. No, no, it's more than that. You, you know how you worship God through your trial? You keep being obedient step after step yeah. after step yeah. after step. Yeah. And you become so preoccupied with keeping your eyes focused on the one whose character you know you can trust. And you keep walking. 
Remember Peter walking on the water? What was his problem? He got his eyes off of Jesus and he got preoccupied with the wind and the waves. And that's when he began, he began to sink when he stopped walking forward towards his Savior. So, worship your way through your trial. So, tests are planned. Tests reveal. And number three, tests refine. They refine us. I was thinking about this. All through the Bible, it talks about our faith being compared, our lives being compared to the refining process with metals and precious metals. And I, I was thinking about this. Uh, in my high school years, I was one of those, like, um, I took a lot of shop classes. So I took metal shop one and, one and metal shop two and wood working one and work, working two. But in metal shop, we would, we would create these molds that you would pour hot metal in to, to make, to cast something. And what you would do is you would take these metals, you would put them in this crucible, you would put it in this really hot furnace, and it would melt the metal down with high, at high temperature. And when that thing come out of the furnace, you didn't just pour it now into the mold you had made. All the impurities first would be at the top of that metal after being exposed to the heat. And what you would do first is you would scrape off the impurities off of that metal that had been heated up. Then you'd take that, that bowl with left with the pure metal and you would pour it in to whatever you were molding. That explains why God tests us. You understand he tests, he uses testing to draw out the impurities of our faith. He uses testing to draw out the impurities in our lives. But that's not the, the stopping point of what he's doing. Then he remolds us into something better. Something different. Something more glorious more trusting in him, more able to be used in his hands. And here's what I want you to get. Every time God tests us, it's to reshape us a little more each time to look like Jesus. That's what God's trying to do in your life. That's, what we, that's exactly what we see with this testing in Abraham's life. And it's astounding. And I want you to see it. Let's go ahead and kind of work our way, continue it through the story. Verse 9, it says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and lay him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So imagine the scene. He's got the knife in the air. He is just about to come down. It says, but the angel of the Lord. Now, this is one of those times in the Bible where when it says angel, it's not a normal angel. This is God himself. We've talked about that through this series. The Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not let anything, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Now, do you see the picture of Jesus that God created in Abraham's life out of that test? It's plain as day. Now, he probably doesn't realize that what God is doing, but when you walk in faith and obedience to God, I'm telling you, that's what God is. He is, he is, he is molding you in the image of Jesus. I want you to notice Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. He didn't call the place the Lord did provide. It's future tense, isn't it? Yes. Will provide. Yes. This testing was more than a painful experience. It actually becomes a prophetic experience. Mm -hmm. Because there's an amazing picture of Easter in this story. And I want to kind of run through this with you. And I want you to think about some of these things. <clears throat> Isaac was a miracle baby, am I right? Yes. So was Jesus. Yes. Isaac was named before he was born. Remember, God said you're to name him Isaac. Jesus was named before he was born. Remember, God gave through the angel to Joseph the name that they were to call the baby. 
Isaac was the one and only son of the promise. Jesus was God's one and only son. Isaac was loved by his father. So was Jesus. Isaac carried wood up that mountain to be sacrificed on. Jesus took that cross upon his shoulders and carried it up that mountain to be sacrificed on. Abraham had to deal with the death of Isaac for three days. Not in the sense that he died, but that the fact that he was going to die. He had to deal with that tension. Once again, verse 4, watch this. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Three days, Abraham had to deal with the thought of his son dying. Well, listen, God the Father had to deal with Jesus being dead for three days in that tomb. Isaac figuratively was resurrected from the dead on the third day of the test. Once again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in the manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Jesus was resurrected on what day? The third day of that trial of his life. Both of these stories take place in the same place. Do you realize that? Did you notice that God was very specific where the test was supposed to take place? I mean, it wasn't like God said, go to your backyard. You got an altar right here, which you know Abraham had an altar everywhere he lived because we saw him building them all over the place. But God says, that's not what I want here. Look, then God said, verse 2, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. There's a specific region I want you to go to. But it's even more pinpointed than that. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Not just any mountain when you go there. There's one particular mountain. There's one particular spot that I want you to do this. I'll show you when you get there. Do you understand what the region of Moriah is here? Moriah is the future location of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built on a mountain. And that's where Jesus would be sacrificed. On that same spot that this story took place thousands of years before Jesus ever died on the cross. You talk about a picture of Jesus coming from Abraham's life. All he's doing is being obedient. You and I know the beginning and the end of the story, and we have the, everything that Jesus did for us written in the Gospels. He had none of that. He's just going through his day being obedient to the Lord. And somehow, some way, what's happening is God is remolding his life in the image of Jesus. A lot of similarities between the two stories, but not everything's similar in the two stories. Think about this. For Jesus, there was no ram in the thicket. Instead, he was sacrificed for our sin so that we could go free like Isaac. Remember, what's the penalty of sin? For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus became our substitute so that we can go free. Abraham didn't have to go through with it. But God the Father did go through with sacrificing his one and only son. And he did it for us. I want you to think about this. You see, when Abraham raised that knife high into the air to sacrifice his one and only son, all of heaven was stunned that someone could love God that much. When God sacrificed his one and only son, all of heaven was stunned that God could love man that much. For God so loved you and me, right? That he gave his what? One and only son. This test in Abraham's life was all about getting him to the place in his life where he would reflect Jesus to the world. It was through the testing that God prepared him for this, and it was through the testing that God refined him for this moment. Think about it. Even the test he failed earlier in his life was a part of the refining process. And once again, God isn't afraid to let you fail. He's not afraid to let me fail from time to time. And eventually, he gets you to the place where God says, that a boy. 
that a girl? You look just like my son. So tests are planned. Tests will reveal, tests refine, and finally, tests prepare. They prepare us for the blessings of God. Do you understand there are some blessings in your life that God won't bring until he's got you to the place where you're ready? But it's more than just about blessings. It's about the blessing of being used by God as well. Look, look at it with me. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 through 19. It says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the skies, as stars in the sky, and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the city of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have what? Obeyed, Obeyed me. Did you ever think about this? The big, biggest blessing that God could ever bring in your life is not the things he does for you, but it's how he is going to use you. The biggest blessing is being used by God. See, we, we, we kind of get lost in our walk with God that this trial is about me, and this trial is about me, and this trial is about me, and oh, it's going to be about you. But did you understand? God put some of you through trials because it has nothing to do with you. It's because he wants to use your life and the trial you've been through in other people's lives. We're so selfish in our Christianity sometimes. Are you selfish like me? It's bigger than you. And I'm not, I'm not dismissing your pain. Listen, we have all been in this room and been through some very difficult trials. But did you ever think to yourself, God would like to use what I've been through in the lives of other people? We have a tendency as Christians to, we go through things in life and we're like, oh, God, God, this is what God did in my life. And we just keep it to ourselves. Do you understand God doesn't want you to keep it to yourself? Do you understand this is why you need other brothers and sisters in your life in Christ? Because they've been through things that will encourage you and you've been through things that will encourage them. Your trials are not just for you. God is at work trying to minister to people in this world. And he prepares you for the way he wants to minister through you through times of testing. Now in your notes, write this down. It didn't make the last, it, it didn't make the note sheet, but here's the last point. Number five, trials end. Look at verse 19. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Trials end. They won't last forever. There are some types of trials that you'll wrestle with this side of eternity, but once again, they won't last forever. One day you'll walk into the glory of God with no more testings and trials the way we deal with it in this world. Amen? So when faith is tested, God always has good in mind in your life always the goodness of the Lord as David says in Psalm 23 David gets to the end of his life and you know what he realizes sometimes I needed the rod sometimes I needed I needed deliverance from my enemies whether I failed or God was good I realized the goodness of the Lord has been following me all the days of my life and I will live what with the house of the Lord forever and ever. Would you stand with me? Would you grab your communion? Before we honor the Lord with communion this morning, here's what I want to do. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I feel like the Lord would say to a lot of us, me, you, the person next to you, God wants you to know that you can trust him that you can trust his character even though you're going through a difficult testing in your life. Even though you don't know how it's going to turn out, you can trust him. And the Lord would challenge you this. 
Stop being paralyzed and start worshiping your way through this. Stop isolating yourself. Stop throwing a pity party. It's okay to feel the pain. But you worship your way through this. And you become so preoccupied with your heavenly father and keep your eyes fixed on him and you keep walking. I don't know if it's going to be three days, four days, five days, weeks, a couple years. I don't know. But I do know this. God has plans for good in your life. Let's go ahead and take our communion and let's celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. If you want to go ahead and open that up. What we see previewed Genesis 22 is fulfilled in what Jesus did on the cross for us. He became a substitute for us so that we could go free, so that we can have eternal life. So let's just take a moment and thank Jesus for what he did. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for sending your one and only son Unlike Abraham, you did go through with it. You had to go through with it because of your great love for us. And we're thankful for your son, for his body that was broken. We're thankful for that blood of his that was shed, for the forgiveness of our sin that we might have eternal life, that we might have relationship with you. And Lord, we just declare your glory today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. Lord, we're in awe of your love for us. Thank you for all you've done all you are doing and all you're going to do in our lives, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and eat together. Let's go ahead and drink also. Listen, I finished on time. We're all right. We actually got a few minutes, all right? We're going to end. We're just going to worship a little bit together. One last song. Let's just lift our hearts up to the Lord. Just as a way of saying, to, saying, Jesus, thank you for your love. I thank, thank you for you love. For the cross, Lord. Thank you for the
never pay, Lord God. We're so thankful, Lord, that you paid it all so we could have a relationship with you. Lord, we just thank you for this word today, Lord, and help us to remember this as we go through times of trial and testing, Lord God, that it is by plan, Lord God, it is to refine, it is to, Lord God, reveal, Lord, and Lord, it will, Lord God, also grow us, Lord God, and it will renew us, Jesus, and it will end at one point, God. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done and everything you've done and spoken to us in this place today. Go with us, Lord, help us to remember as we go through this Easter week, God, the sacrifice that you made, God. We love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend, Easter weekend. Have a great weekend. Invite your friends and family.